xong anh chơi những cái chỗ ông chúng mình về đây cả một tổ cái chấm đá cao để tệ bị thì sạm đá cao thì làm bông chơi những làm chi sai câu vật thi là rì cả vì cho thành lập tiếp vật tầm miền nâng vật tầm miền phía kỳ đây từ ban chơi ở chỗ rùm được nông cách chấm đá cao để tệ bị thì sạm đá cao tầm rập ngày nay ສົມກອບລົກພຽນພຽກກິດໄດ້ຖືຈໍລວມໃນ chia cách bên to xem anh chơi xã về nhà ông đã chết là bên to thôi sẽ đây thay ca ta đây vì sẽ đây dần than mình chậm cách về phía xa đỉnh đầu xem chơi anh Mr. President, Your so, Honours, yesterday we completed our submission on the evidence in relation to the crimes and the jurisdiction of the, of the crimes charged. And in relation to the evidence on the accused's participation in those crimes. To finalise our submission today, we would like to now address you on two areas. First, how the accused's participation in the crimes can be legally characterised in terms of the accused's individual criminal responsibility under Article 29 of the ECC law. And second, we would like to address your honours on what factors should be taken into account when considering the sentence. Your honours, Given the unplanned breaks uh, yesterday, I believe the prosecution has about an hour and 25 minutes left of their allotted five hours, and I will finish well within that time allotted. Briefly, before I commence, I'd like to make two corrections to yesterday's submission on one correction. First, in relation to the evidence of the accused's physical mistreatment of detainees of S21, I referred to him beating prisoners with sticks in 1977. Sorry, 19, 1977. I source this incident to the evidence of Lak Min, Chan Pal and Yen Hen. The evidence reference, in fact, should just be to Nhiem N, which I can refer your honours to at trial day 4th of August 2009, the English transcript at page 119 to 120 and 128. Your honours, the accused is charged in the indictment under Article 29 of the law as a planner, instigator, orderer, aider and a better, and a person who committed the crimes at S21. Put simply, if we bear in mind the accused's role in the establishment of S21, right up to the managing and its final day, 
clearly establishes that he undertook all of those forms of participation as identified in the indictment. He had to act in these different ways to commit the crimes due to the fact that he was involved in the establishment of the prison. The sheer size of the prison and the staff at S21 and S24, as well as because of the fact of the length of the operation of the prison and the accused hands-on management role. Although this makes common sense, we have detailed the law and applied the facts to it. How his participation fulfills, fulfills each mode of this liability in our written brief, which we filed two weeks ago with Your Honours, and we refer Your Honours to that for further submissions. Your Honours, the accused is also charged as a superior who failed to prevent or punish his subordinates from committing the crimes. Again, there is no doubt that he had absolute control over his staff at S21 and S24 and that he was well aware that the crimes were occurring and he failed to prevent or punish them. This is obvious, of course, because he wanted his subordinates to commit them. I will now discuss more specifically the accused's responsibility for the crimes under the mode of liability called commission. We have asked you to reflect in your judgment the full scope of the criminal's of the accused criminal activity by finding him guilty for his crimes at S21 as part of a joint criminal enterprise. This form of liability, as you are well aware, has been determined by international tribunals to be a form of commission. And why is it important? Simply because in such a case as this, it more accurately reflects the facts and captures the essence of the accused's criminal responsibility. The accused did not act alone, nor could S21 have achieved its horrific efficiency had the entire enterprise not involved the accused planning and working together with his immediate superiors and his immediate subordinates. Your Honours, this was an enterprise of an enormous scale, criminal to its core. The legal recognition of commission of crimes by participation in a criminal plan or enterprise has been a part of international criminal law since the Nuremberg trials. It has been applicable before both the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, the Special Panel for Serious Crimes in East Timor, the State Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina, the Special Court of Sierra Leone whose statutes refer to the same modes of liability as Article 29 of the ECC law. By following the language of these statutes and on this issue, the drafters of the ECC law clearly intended the provision to be interpreted and applied consistently with the law of international tribunals. Applying commission by a joint criminal enterprise to this case is consistent with international criminal standards as practiced before international courts. In fact, given the facts of this case, refusing to apply this mode of liability would place this court at odds with every international criminal court uh, and would amount to an error in the application of the law. The essence of committing a crime by a JCE is that individuals in positions of power must be held accountable for the full extent of their criminal responsibility. 
ការអនុវត្តចាំចាំពីគ្រប់ដល់ដល់ដល់ដល់ដល់ដល់ដល់ដល់ដល់ដល់ដល់ដល់ដល់ដល់ដល់ដល់ដល់ដល់ដល់
ក្នុងការបកបកអ្នកគ្រប់រៀងនិងវិធានផ្ទៃក្នុងកម្មមិនបានចែកអោយមានចំណុចអ្វីផ្សេងក្រាវពីទីដែរហេតុដូច្នេ
ដោយផ្ដល់ថ្ងៃនេះនិងទី 1 ซึ่งตั้งแต่ตัวตัวเป็นตัวตั้งแต่ตัวตั้งแต่ตัวตั้งแต่ตัวตั้งแต่ตัวตั้งแต่ตัวตั้งแต่ตัวตั้งแต่
when he started in S21, in his early 30s, he was not naive and impressionable like most of the staff. He personally employed many documents. Having spent four years as the chairman of M13, he knew what was expected of him. Although perhaps less sophisticated in its operations than S21, M13 had the same purpose and method of operation. Its goal was to arrest, detain, interrogate, torture and execute CPK's enemies. From his experience, the accused was just was not just well versed in the ordering of interrogation, torture and killing, yet personally tortured many times himself. Therefore, from the moment he was asked to establish S21, his second interrogation, torture and killing centre, the accused understood the exact nature of the undertaking and he was ready and willing to accept it. The fact that he was an intelligent man who had undergone extensive education when he made his free choice is a relevant matter that the chamber should consider his sentence. Having dealt with the gravity of the offence, the degree of the accused participation and the circumstances, I will now turn to factors of international criminal courts consider as aggravating in the consideration of an appropriate sentence. Three particular recognised aggravating factors are relevant in this case. First, the accused Second, the particular cruelty inflicted. And third, the defencelessness of the victims. Abuse of power. Although the mere fact that an accused holds a position of authority is not an aggravating factor, the manner in which that authority is exercised may be. The accused, as a prison warden, had legal and moral obligations to protect the rights of its detainees. Yet, in reality, he presided over the systematic mistreatment, torture and murder of those under his care. At no point during his chairmanship could it be said that he had any intention or felt any duty to protect the welfare of the prisoners. The accused did and fought the exact opposite. The purpose of his role was not to protect, but in fact to degrade, torture and kill those who otherwise should have expected his protection. Second, turning to the cruelty, the particular cruelty for which the crimes were committed, international jurisprudence holds that the infliction of unusual pain and suffering should be seen as aggravating in sentencing. Such pain and suffering must go beyond the normal commission of the crime and display a particular, particularly savage, sadistic or ruthless quality. And cruelty can be this, considered to be psychological or physical. The catalogue of brutality employed by guards and interrogators at S21 was truly grotesque. The prisoners were subjected to savage beatings which left them with bloody exposed wounds. Their toenails and fingernails were ripped up with pliers. They were humiliated and forced to pay homage to images of dogs and to physical objects. Some prisoners were electrocuted to the point of unconsciousness, others were nearly drowned. Particularly cruel was the forced feeding of excrement. Prisoners also suffered the horrors of being surgically operated on whilst alive and having their blood drawn, resulting in a slow, agonising death. The brutality of S21 was particularly unbearable psychologically. The terror, shock, fear and utter confusion endured by the prisoners is beyond our imagination. 
These prisoners were held in cells, aware of the torture and suffering that surrounded them, seeing wounds and moans of the victims that foreshadowed their own fate. The degrading, humiliating and sanitary conditions in the cells made many prisoners fall sick. Some prisoners died in these conditions, their corpses often remaining in the communal leg irons for hours or at times overnight before they were taken away. Imagine what each prisoner would have felt lying in those shackles when fellow prisoners disappeared, wondering when their name would be called. It's no wonder prisoners committed suicide or attempted, believing that, their, that ending their pain was better than enduring it whilst they lived. Again, from this distance, we cannot even begin to understand the extreme psychological effects of being subjected to multiple interrogation and torture sessions with the savage violence these prisoners endured. The final act of cruelty committed against each prisoner came at Chung Ek. Blindfolded and handcuffed, the prisoners were forced to kneel down in the dark next to their own burial pits. There they waited until the blow of a shovel or cart axle broke the back of their heads. And if that did not kill them, their throats were slit before they were kicked into their grave. Your Honours, the third and final factor we submit for consideration as an aggravating factor relates to the particular defencelessness of the victims. These prisoners had no protection, starved, shackled, tortured, with no ability to defend, to defend themselves, they were helpless. Your Honours, we submit that in this case, all three aggravating factors, abuse of power, particular cruelty in the crimes, and the defencelessness of the victims are directly relevant and must be taken into account in determining the accused sentence. Your Honours, just as you should take into account the aggravating factors when determining your sentence, you should also take into account any mitigating factors that may be present. The defence may argue that the accused committed his crimes under duress and because he was acting under superior orders. In addition, they may request that you take into account his cooperation, his de facto guilty plea, remorse, and the consequent effect that these factors may have on national reconciliation in Cambodia. I will first discuss duress. As we've, as we've explained at length, the accused claims he hated his work and committed these crimes under duress out of fear that he would be killed if he disobeyed his orders. And as I've stated earlier, the evidence does not support this interpretation of the facts. The asset the, the assertion the accused was both a hostage and a prisoner of the CPK, even at an early stage of his involvement in, of his involvement in the criminal activities, is contradicted by recollections from Francois Bizot, his prisoner and confidant at M13. Bizot writes, terror from that moment became all-powerful it seduced him by putting on the face of morality and order. Bizo did not see a man in terror, but rather a man of terror. The accused assertion that he was in fear throughout S21's operations is contradicted by his own statements to the investigating judges. He told them, and I quote, I was particularly affected after seeing the mass arrest of Cadre from the northern zone on the 31st of January 1977 because I felt a lot of sympathy for them. 
I was terrified. And after the arrest of Nye, Nye Yu Hau Hong on the 13th of March 1978, and Vaughan Vett on the 2nd of November 1978, I began to fear for my life. Therefore, in his own words, he began to fear for his life in 1978. This is likely to be closer to the truth and conforms with the analysis of Dr. Chandler. In arguing their claim of duress, the defence contend that the fear which motivated the accused emanated from a climate of terror the grip democratic camp The existence of such a claim is undoubtedly true and has been established by both witness and expert testimonies at trial. That is the existence of a climate of terror. But what the defence have not established is that the accused was subject to that terror. In fact, the evidence demonstrates that he was unaffected. It demonstrates that he was not a victim of terror, but it's The accused as protector of the CPK party centre was entrusted with intelligence gathering and state security. His position all made, also made him in the words of Elizabeth Becker, one of the half dozen most important leaders in the country. Taken together, the evidence does not show a fearful man. To the contrary, it demonstrates a confident man who spreads terror across Cambodia through his work at S21. A man who is irreplaceable in his position. It is well recognised that totalitarian regimes that maintain control through terror, that they do maintain control through terror. It's also accepted that these terror systems often turn on their creators. As the philosopher and Holocaust survivor Hannah Arendt states, terror turns not only against enemies, but against its friends and supporters as well. The climax of terror is reached when the police state begins to devour its own children. When yesterday's executioner becomes today's victim. Given the all-consuming terror that, that exists in the democratic culture, it's not surprising the accused and the other senior leaders eventually felt fear. It would be far more surprising if they didn't. Ultimately, the fact that the accused may have felt fear in 1978 does not overshadow the fact that he freely and willingly designed a system of terror or that he was once an enthusiastic and willing participant in these crimes. Your Honours, the accused should not be able to hide behind the effects of the terror that he in fact created. Furthermore, he cannot be credited for the fear he says he may have felt in 1978 when the vast majority of the crimes had already been committed. The presence of duress is closely linked to the mitigating factor of committing crimes pursuant to superior orders. Under Article 29, it leaves open the possibility that acting pursuant to superior order at the discretion of this court may mitigate punishment, although the presence of them cannot be a basis to extinguish criminal responsibility. Under international criminal law, a subordinate attempting to rely upon a superior's orders as a mitigating circumstance must show that the orders had an influence on his or her behaviour. If the subordinate was already prepared to carry out the criminal conduct, no such mitigating circumstance can be said to exist. This, Your, Your Honours, we submit is a situation in the case of the accused. As we've already shown, it was the accused's own desire to advance the revolution and smash its enemies and not the superior's specific orders 
ដោយហេតុការណ៍នេះយើងខ្ញុំសូមលើឡើងថាសុភាពអ៊ុរដើរសាធារណរដ្ឋអាមេរិកាចេញបញ្ជាដោយហេតុការណ៍នេះយើង
And after this realization, he has provided evidence to the investigating judges and prosecution on the inner workings of S21. And he's provided evidence on the structure and policies of the CPK and the implementation of those criminal policies during the DKP period. And he's also provided information which is of significant value in the prosecution of other senior leaders. That said, and we welcome that, and he should be given some credit for that. But that said, with regard to his own responsibility, as we have submitted, he has only admitted part of the truth. Despite accepting general overall responsibility for the crimes, he is in effect telling the court, I did a terrible thing, but it's not really my fault. It's the fault of my It should also be recalled that he has mostly admitted crimes that are undoubtedly established by the documentary evidence and not more. Your Honours, he accused lack of cooperation with the court in deciding to only admit a limited responsibility for the crimes to minimise the sentence is further demonstrated in the defence strategy of the trial. The defence have continually tried to limit the scope of the evidence and the ability of this trial chamber to review the relevant facts of this case. This has been done through a number of legal challenges. If you look at the cumulative effect of these challenges, it's clear that they've been designed to reduce the impact of the crimes and his personal responsibility. I will briefly outline some aspects of this strategy. First, at the outset of this case, in their opening, the defence were effectively asking you to find that there was little evidence to support the personal jurisdiction requirement necessary to prosecute the accused. Uh, arguing on the one hand that this jurisdictional element is not made out, and yet on the other hand, stating that the accused has been completely cooperative with the court, and yet still trying to undermine the case against him. I'm referring to the jurisdictional requirement that the accused was either a senior leader or most responsible. For the crimes in Democrat Second, the defence's objection to the admission of any evidence or testimony concerning the accused prior conduct and prior behaviour occurring for four years at the M13 Security Centre was clearly designed to reduce the ability of this trial chamber to determine his motive and intent for committing the crimes at S21. By trying to restrict your honours from hearing this evidence, your honours would have had less ability to determine the address, to determine, to address the key issue in this case as the accused, as the accused willingness to commit the crimes at S21. They did not want to be taken to account the fact that he was an experienced, hardened, torturer and killer well before arriving at S21. Yet, the defence were more than happy for your honours to hear of his good character in his early years as a student and teacher before arriving at S21. Third, the defence objection to the submission by the prosecution of detailed witness summaries of every key witness statement in this case to the trial chamber was clearly motivated to ensure that the impact of the crimes and the role of the accused was less easily discovered. The practice of providing, providing comprehensive summaries of large amounts of evidence, particularly witness statements, is common at other international criminal courts. This is to ensure the focus is kept on the key issues so that all parties, including the Chamber, cannot become lost in the sea of evidence. In effect, these tools are a roadmap to assist the trial chamber and the parties 
to understand the key issues of the case more quickly. The purpose of the objections was clear. Less clarity in the case would lead to less clarity as to the role of the accused and the impact of the crimes. The defence clearly attempted to inhibit the flow of evidence to this chamber by objecting to a proposed reserve witness list. A reserve witness list would put forward by the prosecutors to fill potential evidence gaps that may have been left. If the scheduled witnesses suffered memory loss or were reluctant to tell the truth, due to the fact that the parties were not able to assess the reliability of a witness, by meeting them prior to the trial, the parties were not able to assess the reliability of a witness. By meeting them prior to the trial, it submitted that the reserve list proposal was reasonable. In this case, particularly, there was a reasonable risk to take into account bearing in mind most witnesses who survived with a staff S21. To put it mildly, it was reasonable to expect that these witnesses would have been less than enthusiastic about testifying due to feelings of personal guilt and embarrassment of having participated in the crimes at S21. With the first S21 staff witness, these predictions were to be true. As these witnesses continued to come, it was evident that there was a general reluctance by most of them to talk freely, especially in public and in the presence of their former chief. Luckily, most of them gave prior statements in the judicial investigation, allowing them at the least to be firmly guided back to a true account of events. Fifth, and unfortunately for this case, the defence decided to energetically take over the court's role of advising the first S21 interrogator, interrogator witness that if he testified, it was quite possible that he would be prosecuted for crimes he may have committed at S21 in the national courts. Despite the fact this possibility on any account was less than remote, the effect of raising that fear by the defence in the manner that it did in the mind of the first S21 witness sent a message through the media to all the remaining S21 witnesses that testified was a risky business. These early warnings beyond the defence's mandate done in public based on dubious legal reasoning no doubt put fear into every S21 witness into fully disclosing what they knew about the crimes and the accused role in S21. We can only speculate what effect these unsolicited warnings had on the witnesses, but we can certainly say the warnings of the defence did not encourage the witnesses to talk to them. Amazingly, when witnesses like Ma'am Nye clearly did not tell the truth, the defence appeared to be able to take great satisfaction about such Here's an actual quote from the Defence Council following Mr. Prosecutor, I'd like to thank you. If you have any other witnesses like this one, please do not hesitate to call them. This remark by the Defence was particularly disturbing, bearing in mind Ma'am Nye was the very witness they warned the day of the testifying in this court. Your Honours, the accused in the Defence may submit to this court we are cooperating and want to be in full responsibility and hope to hold the truth about S21 to assist in this country's reconciliation process. It's difficult to see how taking such great satisfaction from witnesses is not telling the truth in this assist process. Finally, the defence have also attempted to limit the flow of documentary evidence to the chamber, which would otherwise assist it in resolving the factual issues in this case. For example, the documents supporting Craig Edgerton's expert report, the conflict documents, and documents containing annotations of the accused's handwriting were all challenged by the defence 
ដោយឆ្នេះលោកបានចំណុចតាមមានការពីក្បែងដែលលើកឡើងថាមិនមានភាពចាំបាច់ ដោយសារគេកម្មដោយស្មោះត្រង់ទេនៅពេលដែលគាត់ដល់សេចក្តីកម្មស្មោះត្រង់គឺនៅពេលដែលគាត់ពិបាកក្នុងការជិះផុត
and confirms the brief statement he made when questioned by his counsel. The accused must accept the reality that unless he faces up to the truth and admits that he committed his crimes as a devoted man with the enthusiasm and zeal of an ardent revolutionary, he has not accepted full responsibility for the crimes in this court. Your Honours, as with admissions of guilt, the trial chamber must evaluate whether an expression of remorse is genuine. It is fair to observe that the accused expressions of remorse have been numerous. Yet that remorse is clearly limited by the considerations of denial of responsibility to which I have just referred. The evidence from the psychologists is that the accused has an inability to empathise. But the psychologists have also said, in effect, he is a pragmatist. They suggested that his conversion to Christianity, that he converted to Christianity because he took the view that communism was a spent force. To the extent that the accused has expressed remorse openly in these public proceedings, it is a relevant consideration for this chamber. However, in light of his failing to admit his full responsibility in the crimes and his limited ability to empathise with the victims, this consideration should be limited. Finally, the defence have argued that the accused's cooperation and remorse would contribute to national reconciliation and that that will be best achieved by a sizable reduction in his sentence. In our view, well, while national reconciliation is a legitimate consideration for this court, the accused's behaviour has not added significantly to it. The central purpose of this trial is to ascertain the truth, impose a just and proportionate sentence and end impunity. To the extent that that process will contribute to national reconciliation, we submit that a heavily reduced sentence will in fact hamper and not help the attainment of national reconciliation in Cambodia. The first must be said that national reconciliation is a byproduct of a criminal trial, not its purpose. As much as the defence would prefer a truth and reconciliation process that simply lays out the facts, Cambodia and the international community chose instead a court of law that applies imprisonment as punishment if convictions are found. It should be recalled that before this trial, he opted to stay with the Khmer Rouge until only a few years before his arrest. His current qualified cooperation, admissions and remorse, while helpful in confirming that the Khmer Rouge committed international crimes, cannot claim to have any discernible impact on peace in Cambodia or in the minds of the victims. More significantly, the defence have failed to show how a lighter sentence would have any effect on national reconciliation. For example, would there be public disapproval and unrest were the accused to receive a sentence of long-term imprisonment? Our understanding of the facts and sentiments in the Cambodian community is quite the contrary. We believe that to take the first step in righting the wrongs of S21 Human humanity must be made whole by sternly punishing one of its own for ignoring it so gravely. Doing so will far more, do far more for humanity and even the accused humanity than giving into a misguided notion that a disproportionately low sentence somehow facilitates reconciliation. Your Honours, the next factor I will turn to in favour of the accused in the time is the time that he is previously spent, previously spent awaiting trial in custody. This chamber has already ruled that upon conviction he is entitled to credit for time served in detention of the ECC since the 31st of July 2007 
and for the eight years, two months and 20 days, he was detained under the orders of the Cambodian military court prior to his transfer to the ECC. Your Honours have also ruled that the accused is entitled to an additional remedy to compensate him for the serious violation of his rights in being, in being detained contrary to applicable law. The case law of other international tribunals suggests that such a remedy would require a specific reduction in sentence. The ICTR cases of Baragwiza and Kalyeli are particularly relevant. In these two cases, the accused received reductions of their sentence of life imprisonment to sentence of, uh, sentences of 35 and 45 years, respectively, due to the violation of their rights and being unlawfully detained. The co-prosecutors recognise that the violations of the accused rights in this case are more serious than in either of those two cases. The maximum length of a pretrial detention under Cambodian law for the offences with which the accused was charged is three years. It follows that at least the additional five years, two months and 20 days of his pretrial detention by the military court were unlawful. The Chamber has pointed out to other irregularities in the accused detention by the military court, including a failure on the part of the authorities to carry out a substantial and systematic investigation into the allegations against him. Here, before the ECCC, as before every properly constituted court in the world, the rule of law must be applied. The principles of fair trial and due process must be applied. Therefore, when an accused is not brought to trial within a reasonable period of time or is held in pre-trial detention without proper justification, such violations must be remedied. And because the violations of the accused's rights are so substantial, the only reasonable response is to grant a remedy that would affect the ultimate serve, ultimate sentence he must serve for these crimes. In a case such this, given the gravity of the crimes and the extensive aggravating circumstances, the starting point for considering a sentence must be life imprisonment. However, the clear principles established by international jurisprudence require the trial chamber to take this breach into account. The co-prosecutors submit that the fair and appropriate course for the trial chamber would be to commute the sentence of life which would otherwise have been imposed to a determinate sentence. Such reduction to be an express and measurable remedy for the breach of the accused rights. And this leads me to my conclusion. Let's recall that unlike his prisoners at S21, to whom this accused denied even the slightest shred of humanity, he has been met with open and even-handed justice in this court. He has received a fair trial in accordance with the law and a bench of independent and impartial judges. If convicted, he will be sentenced to a punishment proportionate to those crimes. Although he belonged to one of the most murderous and barbarous regimes in the history of mankind, he will be sentenced only for the crimes he committed. At S21, prisoners never received such treatment. They were falsely accused and arbitrarily punished. No counsel can argue their case, no opportunity to, affront, to confront their accusers at a public trial, no ability to challenge the verdict and sentence in a higher court. On the contrary, the accused ensured they were treated as animals. To him, they were enemies of the state who deserved no mercy and no compassion. Of course, Your Honours, 
nothing can justify the brutality and humanity in S21. And yet this accused clearly believed the unthinkable acts perpetrated on the victims were not only justified but necessary. Nothing short of that misguided belief throughout the years during which he engineered, perfected, and meticulously managed the CPK's most effective killing machine. As we've illustrated, he worked tirelessly to identify, arrest, and smash perceived enemies. He created the very multiplier effect which spread the web of S21 throughout Cambodia. The accused repeated apologies and his tears at Chomet when confronted with the skulls of thousands of his victims will be held up to your honours as evidence of his contrition. We do acknowledge that he has admitted the majority of the underlying crimes of S21 and his responsibility as chairman. And yet we must view his alleged remorse in the context of his continued refusal to admit his active and enthusiastic participation in the crimes. Clearly, Your Honours, any denial of the base crimes of S21 would have been futile in the face of the physical, testimonial and expert evidence before this court. But wherever possible, the accused has adamantly sought to minimise his role. He accepts responsibility only on his own terms, where he attempts to paint a picture of himself as an unwilling participant caught up in a machine he could not escape trapped by secrecy and terror. You must not allow him to hide behind these false claims. You must recall that he was not a victim of the system, but its loyal and dedicated agent. Mr. President, allow me to refer to a quote which encapsulates the dilemma that human dignity would have put before the accused when he perpetrated these crimes. William Shawcross, the leading British prosecutor at the Nuremberg War Crimes Trial, said, There comes a point when a man must refuse to answer to his leader if he is also to answer to his own conscience. Your Honours, in committing these crimes, the accused abandoned his conscience. In fact, he abandoned every duty we, as human beings, owe to one another. The primary focus of this trial must be the gravity of the crimes, their impact on the victims, and the accused role in the infliction of that suffering. The sentence must therefore properly reflect the, the destruction the accused perpetrated so willingly and enthusiastically. It must reflect his conscious and free choice to, to abandon all respect for human life, life and his choice of abuse of power over conscience. In ordinary circumstances, in case of conviction, the only appropriate punishment for the accused would be a life sentence of imprisonment. In this case, however, specific factors warrant a reduction from life imprisonment to a fixed number of years. First, we submit that the conversion of a life sentence to 45 years would provide an express, measurable and appropriate remedy for the accused prior unlawful detention. Second, we ask that a further reduction of five years be granted for his general cooperation, limited acceptance of responsibility, his conditional remorse, and the possible effect it may have on national reconciliation. We submit, therefore, that the sentence to be opposed by this trial chamber should be 40 years imprisonment.
đã tu cho quân thần y kia sai sập chân nằm. Your Honours, we ask you to remember the stories of the thousands of those victims who suffered at S21. Your Honours should be mindful of the dreams and opportunities that were denied. Also keep in mind the S21's unrelenting brutality that was meted out with no mercy to all prisoners, including hundreds of children, the most defenceless of victims. Finally, bear in mind the loss and suffering of the families of those victims who are still suffering to this very day. Not just the victims and their families, but the whole of humanity demands a just and proportionate response to these crimes. And this court must speak on behalf of that humanity. It must punish the accused justly and send a clear message that crimes like these must never be perpetrated again. Cambodians have come to this court from their towns and villages from around the country. Many have come from overseas and millions of others are watching intently on TV. They are waiting for a justice that tells us our humanity will be protected. They are waiting for a justice that tells them and tells those distant voices from S21 that this justice was done in their name, every single one of them. Mr. President, Your Honours, let your judgment speak for justice in finding this accused guilty and imposing the sentence we have recommended. A sentence which reflects criminal responsibility for more than 12,000 crimes. In imposing this penalty, you are not taking away the accused humanity, but you are giving it back, back to the victims of S21. That concludes the prosecution's final statement. សិក្ដីបញ្ចប់នៃសន្តិស្ថានរបស់ដំណាងអាយការសំអរគុណលោកធាត ចប់នៅកាច់ភាសាដេញដល់ហើយពេលវេលាក៏ដូចជាដល់ពេលត្រូវឈប់សម្រាក់ផងដើម្បីជិះវាង <coughs> <coughs> ខ្វះ